uh, really looking forward to uh, recording this conversation because Harrison here, along with a few other very smart individuals, are looking to raise $400 million to turn Bitcoin carbon negative. Uh, we're going to talk about climate change and CO2 emissions in this video, or we're just going to touch on it. We're going to touch on the FUD and the negative media around Bitcoin using lots of energy, being energy intensive, Bitcoin mining, putting a lot of energy or a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. We're going to talk about how Bitcoin is projected to be carbon negative by 2027. So now four years. And then, and then of course, the half a billion dollars mm -hmm. Hopefully. <laughs> you, you guys are trying to raise. So it's it, it, this is a really interesting yep. conversation to me because it's not just about the climate, but it's also about bringing cheap energy for hundreds of millions, if not billions of people over the next few decades. So Harrison, thank totally. you for taking some time and joining me. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, before we before we get started, uh, apologies for this mustache. I know when we spoke two weeks ago, I didn't have it. Uh, my friend is getting married in October and his only requirement for his groomsmen is that we all have mustaches. So bear with me for the next six weeks and uh, we'll, we'll keep it. My wife hates it, but we'll see where it goes. So yeah, but sometimes thank you we have to sacrifice. <laughs> sometimes you have to That's sacrifice right. for those we love. So uh. That's right. It's true. It's true. <laughs> All right. Um, so, well, thanks again for having me and thanks again for giving us kind of a, a platform to get this message out, because I, I think this idea around making Bitcoin and the Bitcoin mining network carbon neutral is really anti every media narrative you hear out there. And I was in the same position about two years ago where my, my background wasn't in Bitcoin at all. I come from a career in consulting and enterprise software. And I, I left that world um, to go into two different avenues. One was really to be more of an entrepreneur. I have a passion uh, for real estate. So I'm, I'm building a, like a real estate syndication investing business. But that wasn't all I wanted to do. I wanted to do something a little bit more uh, mission-based or, or, or purpose-driven, if you will. And um, I, I think like you, I caught the the Bitcoin bug around 2017, if if I'm correct. And you you caught the bug around the same time when there was huge price volatility ish. And um, I was like, this thing is crazy. You can make 10% in a day trading Bitcoin. What is this? And I, like everybody else, entered as we were talking before we got on camera um, about how the noobs enter in, in the bull markets, right? And um that was me. And I got some exposure. I traded out of it. I mean, looking back, it was a thousand dollars a coin at the time. I, I should have uh, stayed in. Right. But um, that, that was my first exposure to it. And then I said, okay, what, what is this thing? Let me learn a lot more about it. Then you learn about the soundness of, of Bitcoin relative to other financial instruments or, or currencies out there. That's very attractive. But I think Namely, what, what attracted me to Bitcoin was this idea of democratizing the global financial system and this currency that didn't have like a leader at the top of it. No government controlled it. No person controlled it. And it was allowing historically the people who were unbanked to now be able to participate. And I think in the U.S. and a lot of like first world countries, we have this very myopic view of how things should work and we don't recognize what other people are going through and how Bitcoin can be a real valuable asset to pull those people out of the generational like uh, cycles that they've been in. They haven't got to get out of those. So there was like all these great things about Bitcoin um, that really attracted me to it. But like I didn't study cryptography at Stanford. So it's like, OK, where the heck do I start? Where do I go? And uh, so what I wanted to do was just devour as much information as I possibly could to really understand, like, how can I participate in this and how can I make a difference in the world? Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, there's a podcast. This is not, I'm not promoting this by any means, but uh, the Pump podcast, he brings a bunch of different people on from various backgrounds. And about two years ago, before I even met Daniel or knew who he was, um, he came on that podcast and said that Bitcoin mining was the most transformational technology he's ever seen to help curb uh, climate emissions. And I was like, can, can I curse on this podcast? Is that okay? Or should I use just good language? No, you can go for it. I was like, this guy is full of shit because this is everything. This is counter to every single thing I had heard in the media before. Like Bitcoin is going to be half of the world's energy consumption by whatever year. Pick your number, right? So it's like, okay, this guy seems interesting because he's an ESG analyst at his core. He is not a Bitcoiner. It led him to this conclusion. I need to learn more. I reached out to him on Twitter. Three days later, he responded. He's like, who the hell are you? Please tell me more information about you. We exchanged some messages. 
And then fast forward today, we co-founded CH4 Capital um, to actually build a fund to invest in Bitcoin mining companies who are mining Bitcoin on landfills. There's a lot of backstory to that, but that's like been the last two years for us. Yeah, there's so much there um, to to dive into. Um, I, I guess the, I guess the first most um, pressing thing <laughs> is yeah. your comment about how Bitcoin can go up ten percent in a day at the time of recording. Uh, Bitcoin's up seven percent uh, today, twenty eight thousand, yeah. just under twenty eight thousand. So I find that quite funny that as we're recording <laughs> this, Bitcoin is doing Bitcoin things, and we should do that. We should do this more often. We, we should do this day. more often. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, I mean, maybe in a year or so. Maybe, I, we need yeah. more time, but. Um, but yeah. I, I mentioned that not to say, oh, Bitcoins never go up, but you mentioned how to you this was of interest because it decentralized the global financial system. And yep. likewise for me, I was not a, a Bitcoiner and now I am. Um, yep. You know, it, a lot of people in my life are excited. I'm passionate about it, but don't really get it because uh, for, for much of my life, I've had more of a missions, humanitarian, helping developing world kind of orientation or passion. So this is like a new thing. It seems disconnected. But I, yep. the thing I'd like to add to your point about decentralizing the global financial system is that if a money is going to do that, it also has to decentralize information and energy because mm -hmm. you can't have a decentralized global financial system with centralized energy and centralized information. Like it, it can't work. So, you know, it's the, the cool thing about Bitcoin is not even that it decentralizes the ones and zeros. It decentralizes the things that, were, that make those valuable, the things that are a prerequisite for it to be decentralized. And so, which then gets back into your point about um, Daniel's um, statements on the Pump podcast of it being the single most important innovation, discovery, technology for mitigating carbon emissions. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and the cool crazy. thing about your, your decentralization point, and I also uh, would recommend everyone read or listen to the Bitcoin standard because they talk a lot about that book. Um, the problems with centralization, specifically holding large stockpiles of gold in financial institutions and and, and the consequences of doing that. But, um, you know, oddly enough, all these weird, all these features with Bitcoin, especially going into this, this landfill uh, methane mining proposition, is that landfills by nature are decentralized too, right? So like while we're doing environmental good, we're also further decentralizing the network as a consequence. Hmm. So it's, it's again, all these weird symbiotic relationships between all these things and these features in Bitcoin uh, that we didn't, I didn't fully grasp in 2017, so. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 an interesting point about landfills being decentralized in that manner. So, yeah. um, so I, Obviously, I think we have to address the elephant in the room being uh, climate change and how that's a very political mm -hmm. issue. Um, I I think I know a lot of your views on I know a lot of Daniel's uh, views on it, but I think to keep it easy for this podcast, I think we'll say <laughs> that um, humans do have an impact on the world, clearly. Uh, we emit carbon, yeah. that's a fact. We uh, cut down forests, that's a fact. We have pollution, um, chemical, plastic, et cetera. And I think there's room for debate on which of those issues is the most pressing, but I think most people can have the argument that even if CO2 emissions were not as distractive as we are told, and they very well may not be, it's probably a good idea to have a method to profitably reduce carbon if we need to offset those emissions. You know, So to me, it's obvious that this has to be a problem um, to be addressed. And that is what's interesting with this Bitcoin mining offsetting carbon via methane, via flaring methane and everything else is that, you know, maybe in the future we change our views on carbon or whatever, but we could increase or decrease that as a function yeah. of how much we're doing. So anyway, I, uh, I know that might ruffle some feathers, but, um, but yeah, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's important to say that, you know, there's middle ground and we don't know all the answers, but this technology gives us a new lever to where for the first time we have a way of reducing carbon in the atmosphere profitably so if you could break yeah. that if you could break that down for us and i have some charts i want to show um backing that up as well but um go ahead yeah yeah so i i think it's a really good uh way to preface the the conversation because you know a lot of people come to different conclusions looking at the same set of data um and i i think two, two things to understand one are it hasn't been of until late that people have wanted um to not just make a return on their investment, but also do good um, by making that investment. And that's what our fund offers, right? We get to mitigate methane and have a economic return because at, at our core, 
I think one of the most common religions that all of us, at least in the West, can agree on is capitalism, right? Everyone participates in these capitalistic principles. And, uh, you know, you talk to Elon, I haven't talked to Elon personally, but, you know, he still thinks we're in an ice age and we're just coming out of this, this ice age into more of a now more like warming climate. That's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, but also we talked about this before we got on air as well. It's like, maybe we shouldn't continue doing what we're doing and seeing the environment warm at the accelerated pace that it's warming at, because what does happen once we tip over that one and a half, two degrees Celsius increase where they're saying that, Hey, there's no point of return after that. And then it will just be a, a death spiral from there. I'm not as pessimistic as that, but, um, and I think a lot of that is like getting people to try to act right by pumping out those headlines. But I think it's also an important distinction to make what is the difference between methane versus carbon dioxide? So when we thought, and when Daniel really thought about this fund, the idea was, okay, I'm a venture capitalist. That's the world Daniel comes from. I've made some venture investments myself personally, but typically what you're investing in is a idea or a very early product that has zero revenue. And you hope that some sort of exit happens in the next five, seven to 10 years, right? And the outcomes of those things happening are really slim to not happening at all. That's why you get outsized returns from or outsized uh, shares of the company when you make really early investments. So Daniel was investing in climate technologies that may do something in seven to 10 years, right? That wasn't fast enough if we need to act by 2030, 2040, whatever, right? Like we need something that can like is proven technology that can work today, right? Um, and then we really wanted to focus on methane because methane for context is 84 times more warming over a 20 year period than carbon dioxide, right? But then one of the other things that we found super interesting when we were doing our research was that in 2022, only 2% of climate tech investment was going into mitigating methane. The rest was going into mitigating CO2 or sequestering CO2. And that like rationally does not make any sense if what if you believe what the UN is saying that methane is our strongest lever to fight climate change, right? So we knew that like we needed a, a legacy technology that we knew worked and we knew we needed to uh, sequester or um, mitigate methane, right? So that kind of brought together two worlds. One was, okay, what are the largest producers of methane? There's three, uh, agriculture, um, landfills, which we're focusing on, and oil and natural gas, and in that order, in terms of their emissions. We chose to focus on landfills because uh, the um, NASA did a study six years ago, or over six years, that showed that we were far undercounting what our methane emissions actually were. And they identified that landfills will overtake agriculture in the year 2023 as the number one source of methane. This year. So we wanted to get it. Uh, in 2032. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, over the next nine years, it's going to be the number one uh, producer of methane. And we didn't want to get in bed with oil and natural gas because that's, uh, again, a different conversation. Um, and we think that oil and natural gas, while it's not going anywhere anytime soon, um, they're going to be movements to more uh, renewable energy sources over time. And this, then uh, is this the, the study the, you're referring to? Is this the NASA uh, yes, study? This is, okay. this is the NASA study. Great. Exactly. Great. And um, so, so with that, what we what we found was that okay, we can with Bitcoin mining technology and it's like location agnostic properties, we can set up Bitcoin mobile mining units on landfill sites and take that methane, capture it, convert it to a generator, combust it, create power. As part of that process, it creates CO two and then powers the mobile Bitcoin mining units. So it's basically alchemy, taking trash and making money at its core. Um, and that's that's the fun thesis. It's not saying that like, we're not gonna go, this, go do this personally. We're gonna invest in companies that are doing it or that have subject matter expertise in, in it. And we can get into the, the debate over why we created a fund versus why we didn't create a company to go do it. But um, we just really wanted to offer our value add as fund admins, because there's multiple components of this. It's not as simple as just like, hey, set up your Bitcoin mining rig, engage with a power purchase agreement with a landfill owner, voila, you're done. There's a variety of different revenue sources that we wanted to introduce into the fund. And we wanted to decouple the risk of the fund 
uh, to be directly tied to the price of Bitcoin. Because as we just saw, Bitcoin price is very volatile and anyone and their dog can put together a model of, hey, we think Bitcoin is going to be a million dollars in five years, but no one's ever going to be, be able to predict that accurately. So we wanted our fund returns to be based off of kind of a combination of everything, whether it be the infrastructure financing side where they pay us back a rate of return, carbon credits. We've done a lot of work on carbon credits and we can talk about that and then Bitcoin, et cetera. So that's kind of our, that was kind of the thesis behind the fund structure and architecture. Yeah, there's a lot there. And I'm sure that the architecture only gets more complicated the more you go oh, in. That's, that, that's, yep, that's yep. your expertise. So that's why we need you. Uh, but but yep. to hammer the point home for people, especially that may not, that are hearing this for the first time and may not fully understand. Um, to me, it seems like a big problem of the, let's say climate movement. Um, are fiat incentives, or at least incentives for lobbyists. Big oil does not want progress. And I think there's a case to be made that many things being purported do not make sense. Um, I, you, I think you mentioned one of them very clearly, methane versus CO2. Methane has a uh, shorter impact than CO2, but it's 84, the warming effect. It, it's yep. significant. And it's not twice as warming. It's 84 times. 80, 84 times. Not, not yeah. 84%, 84 times. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Important distinction. Mm -hmm. And so things like that, that are avoiding some of what are perhaps the real problems. And likewise, avoiding things that might perhaps be real solutions, such as Bitcoin mining, such as nuclear energy, um, and instead of focusing on other things. And so for me, when I have thought about this problem before, to me, the only way to cut around that lobbying and to cut around that lack of pursuing the best option is to make the best option as profitable as possible. I think of uh, a, a recent example I think of would be the ozone layer with CFCs in the late 20th yeah. and early 20th century here. Um, you know, Many people have heard about the ozone layer, wonder why we don't hear about it anymore. It's because in the late 2070s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, uh, we had all these CFCs um, going into the atmosphere, creating this problem of the ozone uh, hole and mm -hmm. ozone hole is healing. And we don't hear about that anymore because good news doesn't sell. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. we, we are able to fix the problem once we created rules and we found a profitable way to do things alternately that were not causing this damage. And so again, to if, if I want to make sure I am saying this correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but basically what you guys are proposing to do is use Bitcoin mining to convert methane into CO2. So yes, releasing CO2, but you know, 84 times less or whatever, uh, you know, 99% or 95% uh, less the warming yep. effect, essentially. Yep. And, and because the Bitcoin mining makes it profitable, you yep. can scale this virtually instantly, while other forms of carbon capture are not profitable, barely profitable, or at a loss, even. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, that's a beautiful summary. And I'll give you a very practical example, even at a landfill site, right? So what you just described, was a economically viable uh, business opportunity at a landfill site, right? Bitcoin miner makes money. They buy a very cheap power purchase agreement that's going to be way cheaper than they can get anywhere else from that landfill operator. And now that landfill operator has a way to mitigate their methane. So whatever local municipality uh, restrictions on, on uh, emissions there are solves that problem for them. And methane stinks, right? So there's an environmental good there that like the air quality is going to be better for the surrounding area as well, right? So that's like nirvana, the way we see it. If the Bitcoin miner wasn't there, what they currently do is just burn the methane, right? And the reason why they burn it is because just like a generator, when they burn it, 90% of the methane gets converted to CO2 but it's just wasting an energy source that could be otherwise used, right? So there's an economic incentive for them to, for the landfill owner to convert that to power and sell it, right? So that's what we're doing. Uh, the other way to convert it to power is to, you know, dig miles and miles of pipe because the landfills that we're targeting are way off the grid and it would take a significant capital, um, significant capital expenditures to be able to pipe that energy into a grid and connect it to the grid. And I think, I don't quote me on this number, but it's like three to $5 million per mile of piping laid to try to get that to the grid. And it just doesn't make sense. No one's gonna invest in that infrastructure project because it doesn't really return any economic value. So like quite literally, we believe this is one of the only solutions that, that works to mitigate methane. 
And the other, the other important point, and we talked about the environmental FUD here and this like idea of what ESG is. And ESG, I don't know how you feel when you hear that term. Um, I think Americans specifically are really skeptical of, of ESG because like, especially depending on what political party or ideology you align to, there's a lot of negative ESG press because like environmental social governance, it's these very distinct, unique terms that are kind of lumped into this overarching bucket. And what happens is I, I'd recommend that people Google IMF and World Bank and what ESG initiatives have done to ruin and destabilize third world nations. What happens is these things that are branded as ESG investments into these third world nations are basically new ways to extract resources from those nations for the benefit of the people making the loan. And the people that are hurt are the people that live in those countries, right? Because goods and services are being made uh, by whatever uh, language is in the loan, right? That you need to make these things that detract from supporting the, the people that live in those locations. It's really predatory and actually disgusting. And that's where I think ESG gets the, the negative terminology. So we're actually super mindful when we lead with ESG, we really try to explain what the real, well, the re environmental benefit of it is. And we don't want to loop ourselves within those other ESG initiatives. Thank you so much for watching my content and being a supporter of mine. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun for me to do, and it's really meaningful to know that so many people are enjoying my content and learning about Bitcoin. I think it's so important for people to get off zero. In addition to getting off zero, it is really critical. It is really important that you also begin taking self-custody of your sats and of your Bitcoin. This is because if you have Bitcoin on an exchange or you don't have proper self-custody, this is going to be a massive problem for you in the future, most likely. If Bitcoin starts having rapid periods of appreciation and there are rapid spikes in demand for Bitcoin, for Bitcoin education, and for Bitcoin advocates and advisors, it's going to be increasingly important that you have self-custody of those coins. So my message to you is please consider getting that self-custody. Now, you can do that on your own. There are plenty of free tutorials online. There's plenty of great work like that. But if you want somebody to help you with self-custody, if you want somebody to help you take cold storage of your Bitcoin, of your Satoshis, if you want somebody to help you set up a multi-sig vault, to set up an estate plan, to set up a plan for you as a person, an individual, um, as a business owner, as a charity, whatever the case, I work at the Bitcoin Advisor and I'm happy to say uh, that I, I really enjoy it. I love working with my clients. You know, my job is literally to help people uh, buy Bitcoin and secure it properly for years, decades, and generations to come. So if you want to learn about my services at the Bitcoin Advisor and what we do, you should click the link in the description. Uh, here you can see, read a bit about what I do. You can book a, a free consultation with me. You can book a free meeting with me. I'll send you lots of free complimentary paperwork explaining how multi-sig vaults work, cold storage, giving you all the education you need. Everything's fully open source what we do. Our main goal is education, helping get coins off exchanges, and people be able to not lose sleep at night when they buy and secure their Bitcoin. So you can feel free to book a meeting with me. The first one is free and complimentary just to figure out what your priorities are and get that adjusted. But if that's something that could be used to you, I, I really really highly encourage you to take self-custody, whether that's with me or not, please just do it. <laughs> but for the many of you that probably will eventually want a multi-sig collaborative custody vault, the Bitcoin advisor could be the place to go. And so click the link in the description, and check that out. Really appreciate your time. I think the problem ultimately comes down to that. And I, I know a lot of people that do not like the um, IMF and uh, World Economic Forum, you know, and all that. Uh, and I also know yeah. people that happen to work there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, totally. I mean, yeah, they're, so, they're not all bad. They're not all bad people. Yes, but I, like, I, I don't think it's a goal. Yes. I don't think it's a global conspiracy. I just think that it's a governmental organization that has its own interests, like every other organization, every other governmental organization. And so, problem is, if you take a real problem and you don't really solve it. You actually make yep. the problem worse and you just muddy yep. the waters and make everything more confusing. And, and ultimately, at the end of the day, we don't solve problems with government bureaucracy. We solve it with innovation, which is, again, why this is exciting. So I have a chart here um, yep. and, and then to ask a question about it. So this is a chart from one of your partners, uh, Daniel up here. You can find him on Twitter. He's got uh, lots of great threads and charts about everything we're talking about here. But this is one that's really good. So this has emissions avoided per uh, a one megawatt installation. So we have solar over here on the right with this. Uh, hopefully everyone mm -hmm. can see that, but that's like a very light green bar. And then we have flared methane, 
uh, here in the middle. That's what you were talking about before. That's where a lot of landfills are doing. And then we have vented uh, methane through Bitcoin. And then these are um, on the y-axis here. We have emissions abated of uh, tons of CO2 uh, equivalent per year. So not necessarily CO2 itself, but CO2 uh, equivalent. So that is a chart that just pretty much shows exactly what you're saying. And so then my question based on that chart being that I, I've given Bitcoin a lot of thought as most people watching and as you have too. And to me, it yep. seems pretty abundantly clear that the single best way to alleviate the pain in the housing market, healthcare, and education is to fix the money, as they say, is to right. eliminate distortions from base layer money. And yep. then I would go one step further and say that if you want to lower the probability of wars, revolutions, and famines in the future, probably the single most effective thing you could do is to, again, remove distortion from base layer money because political wars are downstream, let's say, of monetary wars most often. You can look at World War I, yep. you can look at World War II, proxy wars. And so going one step further, would you say that based on this concept of what we're talking about, do you think the case could be reasonably made that venting methane via Bitcoin mining perhaps is one of, if not the single most effective thing, uh, the single most effective innovation for attacking the problem of humans' excessive CO2 emissions and warming of the climate if, if that's believed to be a significant problem? Do you think that that's... Do you think it's the single most effective thing to do that? Yeah. Do you want to come be an advisor to our fund or a spokesperson? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, I, I, that's... I would made a spokesperson for Bitcoin, but if you ever have a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you ever have a million dollars in that 400 million, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, but, totally. but, but no, really, I, I'm, I'm serious. Cause like, okay. I, I think about, okay, let's say that warming the planet is going to have, you know, I don't believe in runaway, you know, we're going to turn into Venus or anything like that sure, sure. Uh, where yeah. every, everything goes extinct, but it's, it, to me, it seems like, okay, this is a problem. And it seems like that the largest contributing factor of that problem that is easily preventable is not carbon, but actually methane, you know, methane is, um, yep. and so it's like, okay, if that is one of the largest problems specifically with this problem, and then Bitcoin venting that methane into carbon, I mean, to me, that seems like a solution. And, and some would say that, oh, well, that's yep. just trading one problem for a less bad problem. You're, you're, deli you're putting a bandaid on it by reducing carbon emissions, putting, by reducing net carbon equivalent emissions by converting methane into carbon. But I would argue that yeah. like, okay, that's to me, that's still a solution because we're yeah. buying time for future innovations to come along. And in the process, we don't have to manipulate people. We don't have to use and leverage government bureaucracy to starve the developing world from lack of cheap, abundant energy, which is what we're doing now. Cause that's what we, you know, we want to be virtuous and claim that, oh, if we just take away from the developing world and we're all clean about it, you know, we're, we're exporting our virtue onto the rest of exactly. the world when their prior, you know, more people die every year from lack of energy and, and cold weather than warm weather. Yeah. And so to me, yeah. you know, then it's like, okay, well, then Bitcoin venting methane is not really most important for reducing carbon equivalent in the atmosphere. Well, then it's like also the single most urgent thing in reducing that government bureaucracy, reducing energy for, you know, the couple hundred million people in the developing world that are trying to upgrade, but yep. yeah, is forcing their energy prices to go up. So sorry, I'm kind of going on a rant there. No, no, I mean, my you, question, but I want to hear your thoughts and reaction. Back. You, you said it, you said it very well. Um, and I'll be frank, I don't have a whole heck of a lot to add because I agree with everything you said, but like, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe Daniel. What I would say is uh, the White House, what, maybe nine months ago, a year ago, they've been, the Biden administration has been very anti-Bitcoin mining, just generally speaking. But they put out a report that said that they are actually really intrigued by the proposition of mining Bitcoin using these stranded energy sources that would otherwise just be waste, specifically methane. And that is the first time that a major nation state has really come out in support of Bitcoin mining and in this very specific way. So we found a way to to your earlier point, removing a lot of the FUD, environmental FUD around how we go about building this business and what the environmental and economic benefits can be. And the fact that the White House agreed with us independently and came to the same conclusion that we did, I think that's super, super powerful. And you know, as you continue to build out and decentralize the Bitcoin network, another really good book that has nothing to do with Bitcoin is called Why Nations Fail. 
And the underlying theme around why every nation fails is because you have extractionist governments, right? They just take all the resources from everybody. And if we can put those resources, specifically money, that is the soundest money ever created in civilization, um, into their hands, like this is a win-win proposition for everybody. I've not heard that term before of extractionist government, but to me, that makes sense. You know, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but 98% of nations in the last 225 years that surpassed 130% sovereign debt to GDP level within 15 years descended into default war or hyperinflation, you know, and yeah. the U S is at that level. Italy's at that level. Japan's at that level. And you know, dozens of other nations are either passing that level now have passed it in the last few years or are projected to pass it in the next few years. Yeah. And so it's, uh, it, it's, it seems very urgent and it seems, it seems like it's a win, win, win. It's a win for you guys, the the fun. It's a win for the landfills. It's a win for the people locally, and it's a win for the people across the world. And that we're not using our government extraction uh, against them. So, real quick, um, the White House paper that you're referring to, if people want to look it up later, I believe this is the correct paper. This was in September yep, that's it. of 2022. So, if you don't want to take this 24 uh, year old's word for it, you don't want to take yeah. uh, Harrison's word for it because you think that he's uh, biased, which obviously we're all biased. Uh, you yep. could read this report if you want to learn more about the White House's um, opinions on that. And so I guess. Yeah. And a good a good Twitter follow, uh, Dennis Porter. Uh, he's doing a lot of great work. I'm sure you follow him around educating our uh, Congress people and senators around why Bitcoin and why it's an economic and social good. Great, great follow. And he was very instrumental in probably a lot of the words that showed up on this paper as well. So, yeah, yep. definitely recommend giving him a follow. Yeah, yep. Yeah, he's great. He and I have talked. I, I hope to meet him at one of these events or conferences or whatever. But um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So so I guess as we wrap up here, uh, what does timeline look like? Daniel's uh, tweeted before that he thinks we're looking at 2026, 2027 or so, uh, the path yep. to carbon negative. You know, again, to clarify people, Bitcoin will Bitcoin mining will still release carbon, but the net gain yep. in reducing methane emissions, which again are 84 times more, let's say, destructive or more warming than um, carbon. Bitcoin is going to offset that uh, the latter half of this decade, which, and yep. then also Ethereum is on here as well. And the reason Ethereum on here, and we don't want to get into this, but this is the whole proof of work versus proof of stake um, argument. Uh, that yep. With proof of stake, it's impossible for Ethereum or any other proof of stake uh, chain to do the same thing, but because Bitcoin proof of work can do that. But anyway, uh, this is what Daniel says of 2027 or so, uh, where Bitcoin could be carbon negative. Uh, do you agree with that? Has that prediction changed at all? And what exactly are the data and methodology for getting to that conclusion? Yeah, so I think the data and methodology, because we only have a little bit of time left, I'd highly recommend, and we'll link all this stuff in the show notes, going to bat, batcoins.com, B-A-T-C-O-I-N-Z.com. Daniel publishes all his research there. So like you can go look at the research methodology most, if not everything, is peer reviewed. So you you it's looked at by a number of other folks. And that's where you can really dive deep into Daniel's analysis and all the great work he's done as an ESG analyst over the last 20 years of his career. Um, but as, as it relates to timing, we're currently uh, really focused on uh, capital raising for Fund One right now. Fund One will be, I guess, it, it's open for investment today. So if anyone wants to invest and get more information, see the pitch deck, see the financial model, all the due diligence that we've done over the last year and some change, uh, please reach out to us. Um, and I, the, the Fund One is going to be a $50 million fund, more as a proof of concept. And we're going to let that run for about a year, year and a half, as we start then thinking about fund number two, which is the remaining $350 million or so of capital that we want to raise to take the whole Bitcoin network carbon neutral. And um, carbon negative, I, I don't even know the politically correct term to use anymore because like, well, we're not we're still emitting carbon dioxide as part of this. We're, we're not emitting methane. And like given the opportunity to, to release equal amounts of methane versus equal amounts of carbon dioxide, you're probably going to pick the carbon dioxide bucket, right? Given what we know about how methane, how warming methane is to the environment. So we're definitely reducing carbon because the source of the energy is a pollutant itself that is going to go into the atmosphere anyway. So we got to do something about it. Um, so time-wise, we're still on track. Um, I think the key component to fund two is really going to be 
more public private partnerships. Cause right now we're working with very like one-off landfill sites here and there distributed geographically. A lot are in South America, some in the Middle East, some in the U S but we really need to find a partnership with local governments that really want to not only understand Bitcoin, you'd be shocked by the way, this is an aside. When we talk to some landfill owners about mining Bitcoin, they're like, where do we dig it up at? Right. So like you see the barrier of entry with a lot of these. I met them. Yeah. I met. Yes. Yeah. 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 So there's the education component, but if, if a, if a local government, like people like El Salvador already have adopted Bitcoin and it's really the standard in the country, um, and they see the economic benefit. If there's tourism, that's key, a key component of uh, of their um, of their uh, their country. Like those are the perfect candidates to really to be able to accelerate this even bigger than the 280 projected megawatts that we need to make the network carbon neutral. So we're getting there. Um, but Fund One's really going to be the proof of concept to then show and demonstrate what we've actually done. Uh, on the, the the carbon credit side of the house. And then carbon credits, again, um, that is a market that is more opaque than most think like real estate before Zillow, right? You had no information on the buy or sell side. Um, and a lot of the markets are involuntary. So price volatility is incredible. So we're really just trying to wrap our heads around that and make sense of it because that's going to be a key component of our fund as well. Great. 50 million now, 400 million total. Yep. In the big scope of things, that doesn't sound like a lot. I think you'll probably no. have years of hard work ahead of you. <laughs> getting no, totally. Up. But then but then eventually, once governments understand this, once BlackRock and other massive organizations understand this, and they seem no, to no. be understanding this, um, I think that, um, sorry about that. Um, I think that things will happen quicker and quicker. You know, yeah. $400 and the other dollars, big key... a trillion dollar portfolio is not much. Totally. And the other big key that we're all waiting for is regulation in this space. Like what is Bitcoin? Right. And like once once the government can tell everyone what it is, specifically these large financial institutions, they are going to then be incentivized to not only hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet, but also green Bitcoin, if you yeah. will. So like that's a more compelling story. And that opens up the, the floodgates more broadly for investments in this type of space. Yeah. Do you have, and if you don't want to answer, that's fine. But do you have any idea, like, what is the value of that? Like, Bitcoin's thirty thousand dollars today. Like, yeah. forget the monetary oh, yeah. premium, no. forget bonds, forget all that. Like, is does this make Bitcoin twice as valuable, or like a thousand times more valuable? Where in between there? <laughs> whatever I whatever I told you right now would be wrong, so I'm not even going to say a number. But thank that's, you. For that's asking. the only real respectable yes. answer. <laughs> yes, but higher, so, uh, right? Probably uh, higher. Yeah, higher, higher. Logically, <laughs> I think logically higher. Um, but also too, like just to talk about the fun team structure in the last little bit of time here. Um, obviously, Daniel's the ESG analyst. He's the one who's put the most thought and research into the kind of why we're doing this and the opportunity. You have me more as kind of the, the operator, um, the person who, who has the, the skills to wrap internal technology, investor experience, fund architecture, all that kind of stuff. And then we went out and got a bunch of great advisors on our team. So we have a large uh, Bitcoin miner CEO on our board, a smaller Bitcoin miner CEO who's doing this on vented landfill gas as well. Um, we have one of the top on-chain uh, analysts for Bitcoin. He's probably the guy to ask what the price is going to be in a year to two years. And then last, but very much not least, we have a person who focuses exclusively on uh, how to... Uh, well, really get carbon credits and then go out and sell carbon credits. So that's the composition of the team. And we've really checked all the boxes, at least internally on the fund side, to help the companies that we invest in be successful in whatever way we can. Yeah, that's great. And the most exciting realization, I think, despite everything that we've talked about in this conversation, is that there's so much more we haven't even talked about. Uh, that there's volcanic totally. mining, there's all kinds of other practical applications for Bitcoin mining, uh, upgrading the energy grid, uh, helping the world offset negative externalities of our energy production, including yeah. methane, ca uh, carbon, and many other um, many other negative consequences we're having. And so to me, I'd encourage people to keep learning more because this conversation is just the tip of the iceberg. I know there's a lot more, very, very much. There's a lot more I could say. Um, but yeah, Harrison, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate yep. it. And I would encourage people to look into 
what these guys are doing is pretty cool. So thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, ch4capital.com. You can find me on Twitter at Harry Zag. I'm a big Gonzaga basketball fan, so we can talk about that as well. <laughs> and then Daniel D.S. Batten um, on Twitter as well. So um, we'll, we'll add links to all that stuff as well. So yeah, thank you Luke, so much for the time. Really appreciated this conversation.